Welcome to the Common Man Football Show. My name is James Coburn, and today's episode, we're going to be talking about the Baltimore Ravens 2017 schedule slash analytics preview, I suppose. Uh, you know, a couple of you guys uh, kind of commented that you wanted me to do uh, sort of a schedule preview like I did of the uh, Falcons slash Cardinals, uh, which those kind of did okay, you know, in terms of you know, some of you guys hit some likes on those and had some questions from those. So I figured, you know what, I'll, I'll do another one of these, even though this is one of those ske schedule predictions are, are really tough, uh, mainly because there's multiple variables you're dealing with, uh, team variables. How do you weigh these variables? Like there's lots of different things. But um, basically what I'm doing is I'm looking at every single position on every single football team and giving a grade to each player so if a player has all pro potential uh, or it's proven to be an all pro player uh, you get points for that type of guy if a player is a pro bowl player uh, you get points for that player uh, if a player is a long-term starter uh, you know he basically hits all the things he needs to hit to be someone who gets to 64 starts or more in their career uh, then he get you get a point uh, for that kind of guy and then of course backups get a certain amount of points less than everything else and then uh, and that's pretty much as far as the grading goes. So I just went through every single football team, uh, looked at their quarterbacks, looked at the running back position, the wide receiver position, the tight end position, etc. Graded all those players and then looked at the schedule to see, okay, here's a team who has this much talent. Here's a team that has this much talent. This team obviously with more talent is going to beat this team. Uh, so that's basically the theory behind it. Now, that isn't really how football works 100% because you could be a really not so talented team and still beat a team that's more talented than you just because of coaching and other factors. Uh, so don't get that mistaken. You know, the, the very much the, this sort of preview is, is uh, not going to be 100% accurate uh, in, in terms of what ends up happening. However, I think it's a good way to just preview – uh, some of the legitimate concerns or places of concerns that can be had about the Baltimore Ravens this year on top of some of the biggest strengths that you should expect to have this year as a team and also in terms of the players that you're going to face during the schedule. Uh, so that's really what this is. It's basically looking at the schedule, looking at what your talent base is like right now, uh, and then of course looking at what are some of the biggest weaknesses, what are some of the biggest strengths, uh, what are some of the matchups you're going to face that are, uh, are tougher than most or easier than most? Uh, and then ultimately coming to the conclusion about how many wins you should win uh, this year, uh, ultimately. Yeah, and, and basically, the more talent you have, at least based on the grading, uh, the more wins you should have. Uh, which, again, isn't always the case, but that's just a general idea about it. Uh, so with all that out of the way... Let's get to some of the biggest strengths of the Baltimore Ravens in uh, 2017. So starting out with uh, the biggest strength by far, in my uh, opinion, but also just based on the analytics, based on when I graded every single position in terms of starters, the biggest strength, one of the bigger strengths on this team was at the offensive guard position. Uh, everybody knows about our Marshall uh, Yanda. Uh, he's definitely one of the best guards in the NFL. Uh, based on his athleticism, he pretty much hits all the sort of marks you're looking for in terms of uh, you know, multiple Pro Bowl and even multiple All-Pro uh, sort of thresholds uh, in his entire career. Uh, he's, he's just been that type of guy. Uh, but I think the bigger sort of thing is that you have a decent amount of depth. Uh, Alex Lewis uh, is a guy that has decent depth uh, for the position. Uh, he, he doesn't really do well in terms of hitting the averages. In speed and flexibility at the position, at least in terms of all-pro and Pro Bowl thresholds, but he, he is above average in most in terms of explosiveness and and, uh, and um, speed. He's above average uh, and has at least average flexibility. So he's a decent guy to have as a backup or even starter. But I think the biggest thing I'm mostly excited about is Nico Saragusa. If you've seen the Baltimore Ravens uh, draft class review. Uh, you would know that Nico Saragusa is a tremendous athlete. Uh, he has a 97.35 explosive or body strength score, a 52.73 speed score, and an 84.74 flexibility score. Uh, and 
in terms of his actual makeup, he's basically almost identical to Gabe Jackson uh, in terms of his athleticism profile. It's just he's more flexible. Uh, you know, Gabe Jackson's a little bit faster for his size, but uh, I think I still think it's a pretty good comparison to make, just in terms of their explosiveness, their flexibility, and the fact that you're not asking Nico Saragusa to, you know, like he's very much a ZBS type, a zone blocking type of guard. That's where he's going to thrive. That's where he's going to be uh, amazing. Uh, and I I just have lots of hopes that uh, if Nico Saragusa ends up winning the job. Uh, in Baltimore or gets to start in Baltimore that you're going to end up having Marshall Yanda who again is one of the best guards in the NFL along with Nico Saragusa who has the potential to be one of the better guards uh, in a ZBS scheme and give you similar impact to what Gabe Jackson gave you and I think that combination is going to do a world of difference for this for the interior offensive line I think it's it, I think if you think about like what the Oakland Raiders did when they brought Kalichi Asameli and of course Gabe Jackson uh, and, and Rodney Hudson too. I think doing that sort of approach, building up the interior offensive line so that even though your tackles may not be great, you still have that sort of inside presence that's solid so that the, you know, the quarterback can step up and deliver a pass without having hands in his face. Uh, I think that's a very good thing for Joe Flacco to have. Uh, so that's potentially what you could have. I mean, based on paper, the biggest offensive strength uh, is the guard position, and I think that's a that's a place I'm very interested in seeing where it develops. Then the next uh, kind of strength for you guys, which you may be surprised, you may not be surprised, is I think your edge rusher position is going to be very uh, is going to be a pretty big strength from an analytics perspective. It's pretty strong. Uh, now I'm not necessarily talking about Terrell Suggs. I include him because he is a veteran. He is a veteran presence. Uh, in the past, he's been one of the best pass rushers in the NFL for a long time, uh, but that was the past. And if you actually look at his impact uh, from uh, a younger, you know, a younger man to now, um, he's getting up there in age, and his production has definitely seen a pretty decent decline uh, in terms of his overall production. So, in terms of the heights of his production, especially, so. 2016 definitely was a season where he got a little bit better than he was in 2014 and 2013, uh, but overall his total impact has declined, um, and that is not too surprising considering that when you actually look at the average market share impact score uh, per age since 2005, um, the you know impact declines as you can clearly see on this graph. The older a pass rusher becomes. Uh, the less impact they actually have going forward. Uh, so uh, ultimately, I think with Terrell Suggs, his best years are behind him. I mean, you know, he, he definitely could have a season where he kind of bucks the trend a bit, uh, you know, because he is he's such a he's such a good pass rusher, you know, from the past that there is ch a chance that he could have one year where he reclaims his glory a bit. But I really doubt that. I think when it comes to Suggs. His best days are behind him, uh, and you've seen a clear trend in his own production of that. And, of course, there's the obvious trends in terms of age, which I already showed you. Uh, but there's a lot of hope with the young people on this line. Uh, Matt Juden, for example, uh, he's a guy that when you look at his athleticism, he has an 83.3 non-explosive lower body strength score, a 91.27 speed score, and a 48 flexibility score. Now, while that doesn't quite hit all pro thresholds or pro bowl thresholds when it comes to athleticism it's very similar to a guy in Olivier Vernon uh, who had an 84.86 explosive lower body strength score a 80.16 speed score and a 56.37 uh, speed score so in many ways you know Juden uh, is uh, a pass rusher who is Olivier Vernon but you got him for a discount you know like he basically has that athletic potential of a Vernon uh, and on top of that it's also about the rookie you got, Tyus Bowser. Uh, when it comes to Bowser's uh, athleticism, he had 82.71 explosive lower body strength score, a 72.84 speed score, and an 89.15 flexibility score. Uh, all those marks pretty much hit the all-pro threshold when it comes to athleticism marks. And on top of that, his, his uh, production uh, with 
solo tackle market share score, a 77.76 sack market share score, and a 69.97 tackle for loss market share score. All those marks hit Pro Bowl production as well. Uh, so I think Tyus Bowser is going to be a key, a crucial piece this year uh, when it comes to your pass rush in the future. Uh, I think that that's one of the biggest strengths of this team moving forward is your edge rusher group because I think the combination of Matt Juden uh, and Tyus Bowser is going to be a really, really good combination in the future. So I, I, And I also think this year, like, sure, uh, you, you shouldn't expect too much from a rookie but Terrell Suggs, again, is up there in age. I would not be surprised if Tyus Bowser just gets more and more usage as the years goes on, as the year goes on, and ultimately the combination of the you know the wily veteran and, and Terrell Suggs with Tyus Bowser and Matt Juden, I think is going to be a pretty good combination this year in terms of getting pressure on the passer, getting sacks, all that stuff. I think this is a really good combination. And it's why your edge rusher group is one of the biggest strengths, especially the biggest strength on defense in particular. Then we get to some of the biggest weaknesses of this team. And uh, the first place I have to start with, and you can disagree with me and it's fine, but the offensive tackle position is a potential weakness. And the reason it's a potential weakness is because, one, you have Ronnie Stanley and Ronnie Stanley's athleticism, he has a 55.74 explosive lower body strength score, a 61.91 speed score, and a 50.43 uh, flexibility score. Uh, if you look at the averages of multiple All-Pro players, Ronnie Stanley does not hit the averages of All-Pro offensive tackles in terms of athleticism. He doesn't hit the averages in terms of Pro Bowl offensive tackles in terms of their athleticism. And not only that, he doesn't even hit the averages in terms of average starters at the NFL level when it comes to his athleticism. Uh, now, this doesn't mean that Ronnie Stanley is going to be terrible or he's going to be a bust or any of that stuff. It's just that you need to temper your expectations a bit with him in the future because he doesn't have slam dunk, future, Hall of Fame type of potential, athletic potential anyways. Um, you know, it'd be very unlikely for him to reach those types of heights. Best case scenario, again, long-term starter. Is real is very realistic for Ronnie Stanley in the future in terms of like his entire career not just one year but his entire career is more likely a long-term starter uh, but that's really not the issue the, the real issue is that you have a guy in James Hurst who our lands has as the starting tackle or at least the starting right tackle on the team and this is a concern because James Hurst's athleticism profile he had a point Four one explosive lower body strength score, a 2.75 speed score, and a 17.97 flexibility score. Uh, the only thing I can really say about that, and you could clearly see, is that there's never been a, a player to hit 64 starts or more in their career with an explosion score that that's low and with a, a speed score that that's, that is that low as well. It's never happened uh, in the last 20 plus years. You've never had a player who hit the, that low of an explosion score and a speed score. Uh, so James Hurst is someone that I, I don't want to say has to go, but he's just a huge liability on that line if he continues to be the starter there. But you do have some hope. Hope in DeAndre Wesley. DeAndre Wesley has a 91.42 explosive lower body strength score, a 92.28 speed score, and, an, and a 67.39 flexibility score. Uh, based on that athleticism uh, sort of profile, uh, he could be a starting right tackle. He should be the starting right tackle. And, and I'll just preface this as this. If DeAndre Wesley becomes the starting right tackle for the Ravens this year, which I hope happens, then I don't think the offensive tackle position is going to be the biggest weakness uh, on, the, on the offense. But it's still concerning. I mean, it's still going to be a concern uh, no matter how you slice it, uh, that the offensive, the offensive tackle position in particular uh, has just not been where it needs to be. And I just hope that this kind of gets addressed because they do have the talent on the roster to solve this problem. But as long as James Hurst is the starting tackle, you know, as long as he's the guy at that right tackle position, it's going to be a huge weakness because you just can't. I'm sorry, guys. You cannot have a situation where you have 
a very average athlete at the left tackle position and a significantly below average tackle at the right tackle position. That is good things are not going to happen if that happens. So uh, I just hope that DeAndre Wesley ends up earning a spot and that Ronnie Stanley, it's fine. Ronnie Stanley is just fine at, at left tackle. But I do think that you need to take into account the issue of James Hurst. That's the big sort of weakness, weakness that I see so far in terms of what the roster is looking like right now in terms of their starters. And then, of course, we get to another weakness. And again, I'm probably going to get hate mail. I really don't care. But uh, another weakness on this team has been the play of Joe Flacco. And... I'm not saying that Joe Flacco is a terrible quarterback. He's realistically been average, you know, for most of his uh, NFL career. Uh, he has had some heights. He has had some lows. But just specifically looking at him in the last three seasons, and this is, a, this is the best way to kind of illustrate some of the problems. From 2015 to 2016, his overall production has been just below average across the board the only thing that's been above average has been his completion percentage and that's it uh you know 2015 2016 he was hanging out in the 30s in terms of his touchdown to interception ratio his yards per attempt have been extremely low his adjusted yards per attempt have been extremely low his quarterback rating has been below average and his total qb stat score which takes into account all those factors was really below average and not only that his third down percentage was below average in 2015 and 2016 and I'm not denying the fact that some of that has to do with the talent that is around him in terms of the wide receiver core the running back core I mean he doesn't have Ray Rice anymore obviously uh, he hasn't had him for a while but he also doesn't have Justin Forsett you know he hasn't had him for a while in terms of a healthy Forsett with a pretty decent season behind him uh, he has not had Steve Smith Steve Smith is no longer there um, you know, and he's having to deal with rookies and younger kind of guys to come in and, and, and form the backbone of this offense. So again, I'm not denying that the offensive weapons around Flacco and the fact that the offensive line, as I kind of illustrated a little bit with the offensive tackle position, has not been where it needs to be. But quarterback position in many ways is a litmus test for how the team is doing a lot of times in terms of offense. And offensively this this team just has to get better uh, especially since when you look at the the averages for teams who win 50 or higher wins 80 or higher wins and 90 or higher wins from 2015 to 2016 the majority of his statistics he put up uh, were indicative of teams who you know don't win 50 or higher wins you know all those years he was below average in terms of the benchmarks you need to hit uh, to become a 50 percentile or higher winner, which is basically 8-8. Eight and eight. Uh, and then in, in terms of 80 or higher, 90 or higher, that's where you want to be. That's like 10 wins, 11 wins, and then 90 or higher is basically 12 wins, 13 wins, 14 wins, division winner. And you're just not going to be a division winner the majority of the time when you put up the type of statistics that Joe Flacco has been putting up over the last two seasons. Um, and I think the key to this, which, you know, again, you may agree or disagree, but when you actually look at his run percentage, again, run, run percentage is essentially the run to pass ratio, the years in which Flacco was on this team and they had a fairly above average run to pass ratio, meaning that they ran the football a lot more than they passed the football. Uh, Joe Flacco's statistics were a lot better in those years. Uh, in, in fact, three of his best seasons as a pro, uh, all actually all of his best seasons as a pro, uh, were the seasons in which they had a fairly above average run to pass ratio in terms of they had a you know a more run uh, heaviness or basically more runs than they did passing. Basically, don't put everything on Joe Flacco, you know. If you make Flacco into something where he has to take the bulk of the passes and and he has to be the guy and win with him, he doesn't 
he just doesn't put up the type of statistics that you need him to put up. He's just not performing. But if you take away some of the response, not really responsibilities, but if you make the offense more run based, more run heavy, at least above the league average in terms of run percentage, uh, he does much better from a statistical standpoint. Uh, the team as a whole wins more football games. I mean, if you just look at the uh, the PDF, which is the point differential, uh, the years in which that under Flacco, the years in which they were the run heaviest, uh, you could clearly see that the, the best point differential years were in the years that they ran the football more than they passed the football. Uh, so um, I think that this is the basic key to, to winning is if, and this comes back to the offensive line, especially. If the guard, if Nico Saragusa comes in and he can really bolster this running attack uh, and kind of help that along and, and make it more balanced, and of course the tackle position gets solved a bit, uh, if all those things happen, this is a team that could end up being a very good run-heavy-ish offense, at least more run-heavy than they've been in the past, and as a result, Joe Flacco's statistics will be helped You know, if this happens. But ultimately, if we continue to see this type of situation where the offense is almost entirely based on Joe Flacco, like it was in 2016, like it was in 2015, like it was in 2013, you're going to continue to have the play that Joe Flacco has been putting up in those types of seasons, and it's just not going to be good. Um, so that's the one thing I can say is all the, all the pieces are in place for a really good or at least a resurgence of what the offensive run game was like in terms of running the football. But if you don't do this, I just don't see Joe Flacco improving. If you continue to do what you've been doing, it doesn't matter how much talent is on this roster, it's going to be very difficult to win football games. I mean, there's no way around it. You cannot have a quarterback who performs like this year in and year out, especially how he's been performing in the last two years without repercussions so bottom line is get back to running the football at least above what most NFL teams do and if you do that I think you'll have a resurgence in wins you'll have a resurgence in point differential you'll just be happier as a football team as a whole so if you want to win more football games run the football more than you have especially with the quarterback that you're bringing here you know you have to dance with the you know dance with the woman you brought which is Joe Flacco, and the best situation for him, you know, when, when he dances the best when you run the football a little bit more, you know, versus putting everything on him. So I, I think that's the bottom line when it comes to him. And, and he's a big weakness just because you, you can't depend on him. He has not proven that you could put the majority of the responsibilities of, of getting first downs, of getting, you know, touchdowns, of, of getting everything, like, He's not proven to be a quarterback who can thrive without having at least a above average rushing attack. And that's just the bottom line when it comes to Joe Flacco. Then we come to their actual uh, schedule. In terms of biggest strengths, uh, maybe not weak, maybe not weaknesses, but just matchups specifically. Uh, I think the toughest defensive line you're going to face in 2017, which may surprise you, but it's the Cleveland Browns. Um, mainly because they have Miles Garrett, which is a great addition in terms of, I mean, he's one of the most explosive pass rushers in terms of analytics ever. Like his explosiveness is basically on par with Mario Williams, on par with Dwight Freeney in terms of his explosiveness for his size. But then you have Emmanuel Ogba, another guy, super explosive, super fast. Uh, then of course you have Danny Shelton, who's another guy who has fairly decent production overall. And I think that when you, if you face that team, now, it's still going to be up in the air in terms of whether or not Miles Garrett is healthy or not. I mean, that's just, you know, so far he's been he's been having an injury bug, uh, especially even early now. So, who knows? But the bottom line is, is he by far, based on the data, uh, that is going to be the toughest sort of defensive line action, if you will, that you're going to be facing is Emmanuel Ogbon and, uh, and Miles Garrett and Danny Shelton. That's a pretty good combination of players. And it could prove to be difficult to deal with that, uh, you know, based on some of the guys you have. You have Marshall Yonda, which is great, but 
if Nico Saragusa isn't starting and you have James Hurst starting and you have Alex Lewis having to back him up, I don't know how that's going to you know, work out. Uh, so, yeah, so that's going to be one of those sort of situations there. And in terms of the best offensive line group you're going to face, another surprise or not, but the Cleveland Browns. Um, they did a major job uh, getting Kevin Zietler. Uh, which I think is a really great addition for them. Of course, Joe Batonio has always been very, very good. Uh, Joe Thomas, of course, is, is Joe Thomas. Uh, and they have a lot of options this year in terms of what they do at the right tackle position. So overall, this is going to be one of the better interior offensive lines you're going to face. Uh, and it's also going to be one of the better tackle positions you're going to face, obviously. And I think that that's what makes them sort of uh, a matchup to kind of... Uh, it's the top matchup in terms of offensive lines uh, because of that sort of... Uh, you know, because of that, that combination of things, you know, if you will. So um, that's gonna, that's why Cleveland is, is going to be that type of team for you. Uh, in terms of secondary, uh, the toughest secondary you're going to face is pretty much the Green Bay Packers. Uh, everybody knows about HaHa Clinton Dix, of course, coming off a Pro Bowl season. Uh, but they also added Kevin King. Kevin King, based on my data, is a Pro Bowl uh, level cornerback with Pro Bowl production and Pro Bowl athleticism traits overall. And if he is starting in that game, you're going to know who he is. Uh, on top of that, they also have Josh Jones, who based on my data as well, is a super duper explosive, super fast, strong safety type with a lot of production to boot coming from NC State. And I think if both Josh Jones, Kevin King are there with HaHa Clinton Dix, that could prove to be a pretty difficult matchup in terms of the secondary there. Uh, of Green Bay. So I think that that's going to be the toughest secondary you're going to face. And then in terms of just straight up wide receivers, it's going to be Cincinnati. Uh, Cincinnati has AJ Green. We already know about him. Uh, but they obviously added John Ross, super fast player. And that combination, I think, is something that doesn't get talked enough about that you had A.J. Green, who's been one of the better wide receivers in the NFL for a while. Then you add a guy that can run 4-2. And, oh, by the way, had very good production at the college level. Uh, so that's going to be a very tough matchup to face. It's going to be very tough uh, for your secondary to deal with. Uh, and you play those guys twice. So, in a sense, your toughest opponents, at least the toughest matchups you have to deal with, are guys in your own division. You have to deal with the Cleveland Browns offensive and defensive line which have gotten better over the offseason. And on top of that, you have to deal with the Cincinnati Bengals in terms of their wide receiver core, uh, which got better during the offseason as well. Uh, so, I mean, those are the biggest challenges in terms of your uh, matchups. But in terms of wins, uh, keep in mind, this is based on your talent. Based on your talent versus everybody else that you're facing, you should win 13 wins, you know. Um, everybody on your schedule, for the most part, you have more talent than them. Pretty much across the board, you have more talent uh, than, 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 you know, except for three teams. There's only three teams where you have less talent, and that is the Tennessee Titans and the Cleveland Browns in terms of overall talent, in terms of analytics grades. But that's not how stuff works out, obviously. You know, the, the Baltimore Ravens may have more talent than these teams overall, but if Joe Flacco continues to play the, the way he's been playing and the offensive line doesn't do the types of steps that I outlined in this video, like if Nico Saragusa is, isn't starting, if DeAndre Wesley isn't starting, if, uh, you know, if Joe Flacco continues to put up the type of play that he's been putting up over the last two years, which is significantly below average production overall and pretty much on par with most teams that are either 500 or less you know he's not even average in terms of the statistics of 500 teams guys like it's just not good so i don't know how you want to take this uh i don't know how you want to interpret this but based on the data again i the data shows you should win 13 wins this year like that is what you should that's the potential of this team is that you should win 13 wins um, or that you should have 13 wins based on your talent but as already outlined there's lots of things that could hold this team back 
you know, the fact that you have a quarterback that has been below average uh, for the last two seasons, the fact that even though you're getting better, I mean, a lot of this is predicated on you getting better at, at positions like the offensive line and, of course, maybe the additions of Nico Saragusa and DeAndre Wesley starting might be enough to kind of push you over the hump so you can start so Flacco can start being a much more efficient player so that the running game can work a lot better so that you don't have to rely on Flacco to be the main guy in that offense. Uh, but it's really up in the air, guys. Like, as much as I'm telling you 13 wins is what it looks like, the fact of the matter is there are teams that just have straight-up better quarterbacks than you. So even though, like Green Bay, for example, is listed as a win, but Green Bay has Aaron Rodgers, you know. So even though... Green Bay may be slightly less talented than you. They have Aaron Rodgers and you have Joe Flacco. Now, who's going to win that battle, right? Uh, Oakland. Oakland has Derek Carr. Pittsburgh has Ben Roethlisberger, who has been playing very well over the you know over the couple you know over the couple years. Um, Cincinnati has Andy Dalton, and don't get me wrong, Andy Dalton is not necessarily the most amazing quarterback ever, but he's been much better in terms of his efficiency and his passing than Joe Flacco. Uh, so the fact of the matter is, as much as you guys have more talent overall than these teams, there's a lot of other variables that make a lot of these wins, at least these close wins, very in doubt. You know, so that's all I would really say about the Baltimore Ravens is that the talent level has definitely improved. But there's still a lot of systemic issues here, a lot of things here that I'm not quite sure are fixed. So even though the data says, hey, you're most likely going to win 13 wins, I just really don't think that that's what's going to happen. You know, based on my own opinion, you can disagree with that if you want. You can just go with the analytics. Uh, but I would just say that that's just my sort of worries is that there's a lot of um, I don't I don't like to project a team to win 13 wins unless there's a lot of things that have already been proven and, and in, in the Ravens case there's a lot of things that just haven't um, you know haven't been done you know to kind of fix things um, so uh, bottom line is this is what I see uh, I think that the Ravens are a very talented team they have a lot of talented aspects to their football team uh, but ultimately, there's just a lot of there's just a lot of things here that could potentially derail the type of season that you guys should have. So, uh, you know, they could end up just going 500 because Joe Flacco just doesn't improve and the offensive line doesn't make the necessary changes it needs to make. Uh, so that could definitely happen as well. Uh, but so far, I think 13 wins is the potential of this team based on talent. But everything has to coincide with, the, like, everything has to be very cohesive. Everything has to work together here. And that is the big sort of, that's just, that's just the big sort of dilemma here is that even though 13 wins is the potential, it may not become a reality because of some of the variables here that are just so inconsistent and so much kind of even unpredictable to a certain extent uh, in terms of quarterback play and those other sort of facets. Uh, so again, my name is James Coburn. You can find my work at draftcoburn.wordpress.com and you can also follow me on Twitter at Geometrics. And if you like this content and you want more content like this, be sure to leave a like and subscribe. Share this video as well with anybody that you know and I will talk to you guys in the next video. Peace.